Howdy. I said howdy. Oh, good. I love it when the audience shows up. Uh, today we're going to talk about a new tool for turning your source code into production-ready Docker images. So buckle your safety belts, because where we're going, we don't need roads. Uh, but we do need safe harbor statements that are not coming up. That's the slide folder not working. Ah, there. We're safe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't work at Pivotal, so everything I say is straight from the divine. Mm -hmm. But uh, Emily here works for Pivotal, so what she says is just for your information. It's not contractual, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my name is Joe Kuttner. I work at Heroku, which is a platform as a service. Uh, we host about 10 million applications and handle more than 23 billion requests per day. Uh, my job there is to curate the Java experience. Uh, so I'm responsible for making sure that our customers' Java apps work on the platform. And one of the tools I have to do that is called Build Packs. And uh, it's a thing Heroku created many years ago, and we're going to talk about it a little bit today. And with me is Emily. I'm Emily Casey. I'm an engineer at Pivotal, and I work on the Cloud Native Build Packs contributor team. Some of you interact with us on GitHub might recognize me as this furry creature here. And someday I'll have a Twitter handle so I can be as famous as Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, let's talk about why you're here today. This is Kubernetes track. You probably love containers. Who loves containers, right? Good. We love containers, too. You probably love Kubernetes. Everybody using Kubernetes. We love Kubernetes, too. Uh, so this is this great world where we can run our apps in containers and orchestrate them with Kubernetes, but we've got to build images somehow, right? So who loves Docker files? Eh, I don't know. When I see the, like, this new container ecosystem that's developed over the last few years and, and, and Kubernetes and all this, it really feels like a bright future. But when I look at Dockerfile, it's like, eh, JAWS 13? You know, this is, this is the future? Uh, there's things about Dockerfile that I think actually increase our operational burden. Uh, and I'll explain why in a bit, but I want to make one thing clear first. When I say Dockerfile, I'm not talking about Docker. So Docker is an ecosystem. It's a collection of uh, CLI and registry specifications and tools. And one of those tools is Dockerfile. Dockerfile is a mechanism for describing how a repository becomes a Docker image. And it's just one of the mechanisms we have to do that. There are other ways, and we believe better ways. And that's what Cloud Native Build Packs are. They are a higher level abstraction for creating uh, Docker images from your application source code. Uh, so at a very high level, they take source code as input, and as output, they produce a Docker image with layers that map logically to your application. So to understand why this solution or why this tool is a better alternative than something like Dockerfile, uh, we need to first take a look at how you create a Dockerfile for a very simple Java application. And we're going to follow the steps that are given to us by the folks at Docker. We're just going to walk through uh, what's in this blog on, on docker.com. Uh, they talk about making sure that you're copying your files into the image in the correct order so that you don't copy your Java files in before you install the JDK because then a change to your source code would cause you to have to bust your cache and reinstall the JDK every time you build, which is very inefficient. Uh, along with installing the JDK, you need to make sure that you're doing all those steps on a single run directive so that you end up with a single layer that represents your JDK. Uh, you have to make sure you're updating your package indices and then removing the leftover cruft from the apt install. So you end up with these bash commands ampersanded together uh, to end up with this you know, single directive. And this is a fairly tame example, uh, but it can get out of hand. If we look at the Docker file for the official Python image that's on Docker Hub, it is a 112-line run command, and it's all of these steps ampersanded together so that the final Python runtime uh, is contained on a single layer without any extra cruft. Uh, this is what I call Dockerfile gymnastics, where you have to like bend Dockerfile to your will to get, to get the kind of image that you want. So while we're talking about Docker Hub, let's talk about the OpenJDK image, which you should not use. Uh, the OpenJDK image has been known to contain incorrect versions of the JDK, like it will advertise itself as JDK 8 update 202, uh, but the app package that was installed as part of that image was not actually built from the source code for 8.202. Uh, 
Uh, OpenJDK is not the only image that has issues. Uh, the folks at SNCC, a dependency monitoring and management solution, uh, did an analysis of the most popular images on Docker Hub, and they found that the top 10 most downloaded images had uh, 30 vulnerabilities each. Uh, so these are not things you should run in production. When you're uh, using a base image from Docker Hub, you're putting a lot of trust in the provider of that image, and sometimes it's misguided. So coming back to our Java example, we probably also want to run Maven in a container. Uh, so now we have to do more gymnastics. We're going to copy our POM XML into the image first so that a change to our source code doesn't uh, invalidate our Maven cache, and we have to re-download the internet every time we change our code. So we copy the POM XML in, we run dependency resolve, then we copy our source in, and then we run Maven package. So it's not something. Uh, an ordinary developer would do. It's something we just have to do for Dockerfile. Uh, and this works OK, but like if you change the authors in your POM XML, you're still going to bust your Maven cache and have to re-download the internet unnecessarily. Uh, also, if you have multi-module Maven projects, I don't know, good luck, have fun. You have to you know, keep this in sync with your repository. So the thing to take away from this is not what this Dockerfile looks like. It's look at all the things we had to know in order to create a Docker file for the simplest possible Java application. We had to understand how Docker file works, how the OCI image format is structured. Uh, at the end of the day, Docker file is a leaky abstraction. It exposes these underlying mechanisms to the author of the Docker file in a way that just forces them to know things they shouldn't need to know. Uh, what's worse is that every time uh, you create a new Java app, you have to repeat this process, right? So uh, in the best case scenario, you're going to copy paste this Docker file into a new repository. And in the worst cases, uh, you're going to copy paste bits and pieces of them because the structure is different or something like that. Uh, some people use templates for this. But in any case, what you end up with is propagating these snowflake Docker files out throughout all the repos in your organization. And these are just the problems on day one. Uh, the real issues begin on day two, when there are security, uh, security patches that need to be applied. Uh, so to illustrate this, let's take uh, an example. The uh, Meltdown Inspector uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, these were two CVEs that exploited uh, characteristics of modern CPUs, and they affected all applications. So if we look at the typical uh, Docker image for a Java application, it has sort of three sets of layers. You've got your application layer or layers. You've got a layer for the JDK or JRE. And then one or more layers for your operating system. So this uh, vulnerability uh, could be protected by patching the operating system layer down to the very bottom. Uh, but because of the way Dockerfile works, uh, updating this layer requires rebuilding all of the layers above it. So even though the external interface for the operating system does not change, we still have to download the JDK, install it, uh, re-download the Maven cache, and uh, rebuild your app, recompile your code. Uh, this is a process that can take hours. So it, uh, you know, it just increases the amount of time it takes you to remediate this issue. But in the real world, you have more than one Java application. You probably have hundreds in your organization. And because of the nature of this vulnerability, they all need to be rebuilt. Uh, so now we're going from hours to days or even months. In the worst case scenarios, you have those snowflake Docker files. They're using a different operating system or a different version of the JDK, or you know, they have some different external dependency. Uh, and in some of those, maybe they've been running in production for years just fine. And then now you have to rebuild it, and it won't recompile. There's something on Maven Central's changed. Who knows what, right? And now you have to spend dev cycles in order to get that thing to compile and build, even though it doesn't need to be rebuilt. We just need to update the operating system. So great, Scott, this is, this is a heavy problem. Uh, it's increasing our operational burden. It's making it more difficult for us to protect our apps to be secure. So we think there's a better way, and that's why Emily and I work on a project called Cloud Native Build Packs. Uh, Buildpacks.io, or Cloud Native Build Packs, is a CNCF sandbox project. Uh, and it is a specification and set of tools for turning your application source code into a Docker, Im into a Docker image without uh, using Dockerfile. As I said before, at a very high level, uh, we take in source code and we use a tool called Pack, which we're going to see a demo of in a moment, to run build packs. Uh, they execute specific build steps based on what kind of build pack they are, what 
whether you're using Maven or Gradle or NPM or whatever it may be. And then as output, they produce a Docker image that is structured in a way that maps logically to your application. So there will be layers for your stack image, which was your OS and some system packages, a layer for your runtime, which is your JDK, JRE, your uh, node runtime, whatever it may be, your dependencies, and then layers for your application. And because of this structure, this like well-defined structure, which is based on the characteristics of your app and not based arbitrarily on whatever directives are in your Docker file, uh, it allows us to do things that you, that you can't do with other tools like Dockerfile. Uh, so aside from the build packs themselves, the build pack ecosystem consists of many different components, including uh, what we call the platform. Uh, and one example of a platform is Pack, which we're going to talk about some more. Uh, there's, uh, pack is a, a mechanism for running the build pack execution environment, which we call the lifecycle. Uh, and then as part of the buildpacks.io project, we define a specification for these things. Uh, and then the buildpacks themselves actually sit outside of the project, and they're produced by organizations like Cloud Foundry and Heroku. So to visualize this, at the very bottom we have our platforms, which execute the lifecycle, which in turn execute buildpacks. And the specification defines the interface between each of these components. Uh, and that well-defined interface allows us to, for example, swap out build packs. So you can use uh, Heroku's Ruby build pack or Cloud Foundry's Java build pack. And these are all going to execute the same way because of uh, that definition for the lifecycle. On the other end, we have uh, platforms like Pack, uh, but there are other options that you can substitute out to run this build pack execution environment, uh, like KPack, which we'll talk about some more, uh, commercial platforms like Heroku, or open source technologies like Tekton. So build packs have some uh, characteristics uh, that make them a better abstraction for application developers. Uh, they're reusable. Uh, so one build pack is used on many different applications uh, as compared to Dockerfile, where you have to create a new Dockerfile for every application. Uh, the build pack itself uh, is battle-hardened. It bu has bug fixes. Uh, they're produced by organizations that are working actively on them, and lots of people are contributing to them. Uh, they're fast. They only rebuild and upload later layers when necessary. If you don't need to reinstall your JDK, we will not reinstall your JDK. If you don't need to re recompile your code, you won't recompile your code. Uh, they're modular. Uh, you can combine build packs to create composite images. So if you have, uh, like for example, a jhipster kind of application with a Spring Boot backend and an Angular JS front end, in order to build the Java part of it, you use the Java build pack. In order to prepare the front end, you use a Node.js build pack. This is something that's very difficult or really impossible to do with Dockerfile. You can't use multi-stage builds to combine runtimes. Uh, build packs are also safe. They allow you to meet security requirements without developer intervention. Uh, so they separate the concerns of the platform, like the operating system version, the system packages, from the application developer who really just wants to work on Spring Boot or something like that. All right, so let's talk about how build packs work. Uh, the build packs themselves have two externally defined phases, entry points, if you will, uh, and then a few internal phases that we're going to talk about as well. So all build packs start with the detection phase, and this is where they determine whether they should or should not run against a particular repo. So a Java build pack, a Java Maven build pack, would look for a POM XML to determine if it should execute against this particular application. After that, we get to the analysis phase. This is where uh, the build pack execution environment decides if it can reuse layers from a previous build or use some cached, uh, uh, something in the cache. Then after that, we run the build. And again, this is specific to each build pack. So a Maven build pack will run Maven. Um, a Gradle build pack will run Gradle, whatever it may be. And then the export phase takes the artifacts that were produced during that build and exports them into a Docker image. And then the last step is caching, taking uh, layers that can be reused for a future build. So if we were to walk through this with an example, uh, we'll take that jhipster example again. We've got a, uh, a Spring Boot backend where we need the Java build pack and a Node.js uh, build pack to prepare our Angular JS or uh, front end. Uh, so the Java and Node build packs will pass detection because they're going to see a POM XML or a package JSON uh, or whatever they require. Uh, then we run the build process uh, to install the JDK, run Maven install. Uh, the build packs will do all this for you. Install Node, run npm install. 
The export step will take all those artifacts and produce layers uh, that map to each of these components. So we have a Node.js layer for the Node.js runtime, a modules layer for your Node modules, a Java layer, your jars layer, app layer. Uh, and then, in this case, we're building on top of Ubuntu 18 and a configuration layer, which tells the build pack execution environment what is in this image. Now, the second time we run a build, let's say we just change our dependencies in our package JSON and our POM XML. Our Java and Node build packs are going to pass detection. And then during the build, they'll only do what's necessary. They're going to use the cache and the metadata uh, to reuse what layers they can, and then just run Maven install or NPM install to get those new dependencies. And during the export step, all they need to do is update those layers that have changed. Uh, so we do not need to update the Node.js layer because it, our Node.js version did not change. We can reuse that one. So in this example, we're building on top of Ubuntu 18, as I said. Uh, and that kind of uh, that operating system, that platform, uh, gives us a guarantee called ABI compatibility. And this allows us to do things with these layers uh, that we could uh, not otherwise do. Uh, so application binary interface defines, or it's sort of a guarantee from the vendors of these operating systems uh, that there's going to be a certain level of compatibility when uh, applying patches. So if we look at our the image that's produced by a build pack build, we have our app layer and our JDK layer sitting on top of this operating system. And let's say there's an outdated operating system that has a CVE, and the vendor produces a new operating system image that has patches. Because of this ABI compatibility, um, we can do sort of a lift and shift, where we take the layers that sit on top of that stack and move it over to the new operating system without actually running a build. So this operation can happen in fractions of a second. Uh, without you know, having to run Maven, having to download the JDK, things like that. Uh, but the OS itself is just a part of uh, the construct that we call the run image. Uh, so run images uh, represent the operating system plus some system packages, and then platforms like Cloud Foundry and Heroku uh, have their own implementations of that. So in our case, both are uh, based on Ubuntu 18. All right, who's ready for a live performance? <laughs> All right, guys. Today I'm going to be demoing two different platforms for you that are both going to generate an image with Cloud Native Build Packs. These platforms are PAC and KPAC. So both of these platforms will execute the exact same lifecycle that Joe described when he did that diagram of the components of the ecosystem. They're both going to execute the same build packs, and they're going to generate identical images. But both of these platforms are optimized for very different use cases. So to take PAC first, PAC is a CLI tool that employs an imperative model, and it's optimized for the local development experience. So it's meant to be run by developers on their workstation. It's going to execute the lifecycle in containers in the Docker daemon. Uh, PAC is a part of the Cloud Native Build Packs project. KPAC, on the other hand, is a Kate's native platform for running Cloud Native Build Packs. It's a piece of pivotal open source software and it employs a declarative model. And it's optimized for managing multiple images, so rebuilding images at scale when a new operating system version comes out or there's a patch and independency. So we're going to start with PAC because it provides the most straightforward introduction to the ecosystem. Um, I have the PAC CLI here. And in the simplest case, you just run PAC build and you get an image. Now, just running pack build and looking at the output and saying it works wouldn't be a very interesting demo. So first, I'm going to describe another domain concept that's used in both pack and kpack. And this is called a builder. So a builder is an image that, when pack executes the different lifecycle phases, is going to execute them in containers based on this builder image. So I have a builder image here for the demo. Let's take a look at what's inside this image. So in this output, and we can use pack to take a look inside any builder, you're going to see a lot of concepts that are familiar from the explanation Joe just gave about the ecosystem. So it's printing out both the local one in the Docker demon and the remote one. But we're going to look at the remote version right now. So first of all, we have the lifecycle, which is packaged up inside this image. This is lifecycle version 040. We can see the different APIs that this particular lifecycle implements. So 
Joe described how the life cycle implements two contracts that are defined in our spec. These are the versions of the two contracts that this life cycle implements. The next thing to notice here is that the builder contains a reference to a run image. So when the builder is used to generate an image, it's going to take the image that exists at this run image tag and use that uh, to pull in the base layers for the image it's generating. Now, the run image that this builder uses lives on Docker Hub. So I have added a local mirror on the registry that we're going to be exporting to as part of my pack config. And when pack runs, it'll be smart enough to know to choose the mirror that has a registry that matches our target registry for the application to minimize data transfer. The most obvious thing in here is a list of build packs. So this particular builder has a set of Cloud Foundry build packs that can be used to build Java, Node, and Golang applications. You may notice that one in here looks suspicious. This OpenJDK build pack has a version called old. It may not surprise you to hear that we'll be returning to this build pack later in the demo. Um, and then finally, we have the detection order. So gone are the days of monolithic build packs. And now we have tiny modular composable build packs. And we put these build packs into groups. And when detection runs, it's going to look for a group where Every build pack that isn't marked as optional passes detection. It's going to take the set of build packs that passed, and those are the build packs that are going to contribute to your build. So I'm going to build a Java application. So if all goes well, we're going to hope this first group passes. We are doing this demo on the Wi-Fi. So let's hope the uh, demo gods are with us today. All right. So I'm going to pass a path to my application jar. These build packs are also capable of building your Java application from source, but this is faster, and we like fast, especially for demos. So I'm going to tell pack explicitly to use the builder that I just showed you, the demo builder. I'm going to give it a location where I want it to put my image. I'm going to put it in my local registry. And I'm going to tell it to publish. Um, by default, pack will generate an image into your local Docker daemon. Um, and this is a safe default option and is good for several use cases, but running directly against the registry is actually the most efficient way to use pack. So let's give this a go. We need a build, pack build. All right. So there's a couple things to notice in this output. Um, it's making sure that our builder image is up to date. We can see that, like we expected, a set of Java build packs pass detection. That's great. If we come down to the building phase, we can see these build packs contributing dependencies to the image. So the OpenJDK build pack is contributing a JRE. We're getting some process types and configuration, some jars. And then in the exporting stage, the lifecycle is turning each of these dependencies into semantically meaningful layers. So when you look at your final image, like your application will be a single layer and each layer in the image um, is understood by the Cloud Native Build Pack tooling. Finally, we've cached some layers locally. We'll use that data, restore it before a subsequent build to speed up builds. So let's take a look at the image we built. Let's pull it down. Let's run it. All right. So it's working. And you can see that this is just a normal Docker image. We didn't use a Docker file to get there, but this is an OCI image. And you can use it in any context where you would use an OCI image in your regular day-to-day -day work. So one nice thing is that the lifecycle adds a bunch of metadata to the image it generates. And we can use pack to actually take a look at that metadata. Um, we're going to use a new command that'll become the next release of pack, inspect image. So let's see what we got here. All right. So when we were describing the run image and said this was the image we we're going to base our new image on top of, we were looking at a tag reference. It's important after you've built to know the exact digest reference, like the particular run image that you built your application on top of. 
The application metadata still contains references to the run image tag so that you can rebase when new updated images are pushed to that tag without having to use a builder or some other configuration. You can see the exact build packs that contributed to this image. So there's one extra flag we can stick on the end of this inspect image command. And we're gonna look at just the uh, remote output here. And this flag here is telling inspect image to print the build materials. So when the build packs run a build, they are working together to create a build materials which describes everything that the build packs have added to this image. So if you look at, uh, there's a lot of data here, but just to make it look less overwhelming, if we focus on this last in entry, we can see that the auto reconfiguration build pack added the auto reconfiguration dependency. We can see what URL that dependency came from. We can see the digest. We can even see that it has an Apache 2 license. So if we scroll up here, I want to call your attention specifically to the uh, JRE that's been added here. So we've gotten JRE version 1103. And that's not great because the latest JRE 11 is 1104 and we want that patch update um, with all the CVE fixes in it. So I'm gonna show you how you can update your image easily. Um, so I have another builder here that has a newer version of the OpenJDK build pack. Let's take a look at this one. We can say, ah, we went from the old version to the new version. This is the builder we want. All right, so let's go back to our pack build and let's run it against this new builder and see what happens. So the build is gonna be faster this time because it's not creating all of these layers from scratch. Um, when we get down to the exporting step, you can see that it gets to essentially reuse the layer blobs in the registry for everything that it didn't explicitly change during build time. So it's adding a new JRE layer, it's adding a new config layer, which we change every time, but everything else gets to be reused directly out of the registry, which makes it uh, very fast. So now if we come and look at our bill of materials, and we scroll up and we find a JRE, we can see, ah, oh, we have the updated version. That's very easy. Um, I had to create two builders to sort of show this contrived example, but if you're using a builder that's maintained by a provider like Cloud Foundry or Heroku, and Pack is always pulling down the newest builder from that tag, this kind of update is just happening behind the scenes every time you build, you might not even notice it. So the next thing I want to call your attention to in the image metadata is the digest, which I showed you before, of the specific run image. So this run image, the one I have in my local mirror, is actually a little bit older than the very newest run image. So if I take a look at my uh, local version of this guy, And let's filter this giant output here for you so our eyes don't bleed. Okay, so we can see here I have a newer SHA of the run image. So I'm just gonna push this guy to my registry. And now I want to update my image to replace the old base layers with the new base layers I just pushed to the registry. We can do this with a command called pack rebase. So I'm gonna say I wanna rebase this out. I want it to run against the registry and let's watch it go. This is very fast because no new layers had to be generated at all. We basically just created a new image manifest that stitched the old application layers on top of the new base layers, which will have an updated operating system and updating system packages. So this may seem too magic. You might be wondering if it still actually works. Do we trust the ABI compatibility? 
So let's pull it down and run it, just so we feel good about it. So all that magic, uh, the application still works fine. Th this sort of update, like rebasing base layers is something that platforms like Cloud Foundry and Heroku have been doing for years on app and production. So you can like really trust that ABI compatibility is something you can depend on when you're rebasing images. So finally, we'll do the most obvious type of update. I'm going to pass in updated source code. If it's here, one second, guys. Yeah, there it is. So we're going to get all the newest dependencies because we've updated all of our configuration, and it's only going to add a new app layer. So again, we can see only the application layer changed. So this is the type of update like most developers will be experiencing most of the time because they're iterating on their app and they don't care about the rest of it. They just want it to get out of the way and be fast. So now if I Docker pull this image one more time and I run it, I can see that I've changed the banner here. It looks good, right? So that's pack. Um, CLI tool, you can see the imperative workflow. I'm telling PAC exactly when to build. The next tool I'm going to demo is KPAC. So I'm going to jump over to where I have some KPAC set up. OK, so I have Minikube running on this machine. And we've installed some custom resources. Um, I have an alias for kubectl, because for some reason I can't seem to type it, but that's all right. And in these custom resources, you'll see a lot of familiar words. So we talked about builders. Cluster builders are just builders that are available for the entire cluster. We've seen a build run. Um, and we're going to show you in a minute how we can apply a declarative image declaration. And KPAC is going to schedule however many builds it needs whenever it needs to in order to make sure that the image you described is kept up to date and looks good in the registry. So first, I'm going to show you that I've already applied a cluster builder. Let's take a look at it. So a lot of things in here are going to look familiar from the pack build output. So you can see that KPAC has looked at the builder tag that I've applied, and it has populated the status here with all of the build packs that it found in the builder. And in addition to that, it has the digest that it believes is the latest image at the run image tag. So let me show you what we had to apply to create this builder. All we did was say, here's where the builder lived and KPAC figured out the rest of it. So now I want to use this builder to build an image. So I have an image definition right here. In init, I'm saying which builder I want to use, the default builder that I just showed you. I'm saying what tag that I want to export this image to in the registry. And I'm saying where to find my source code. So I'm going to use this demo app in my GitHub, looking at master right now. So let's go ahead and apply that. OK. So we've applied the image. You can see it in our list of images. And this tag is currently not up to date with what's described here. So KPAC is going to kick off a build for us. We can see the build here. This build behind the scenes is going to schedule a pod, which is going to run all of those lifecycle steps we saw running in Docker in a series of init containers in Kubernetes. So this comes with a tool. KPAC comes with a logs tool that we can use to look at this image. So I'm going to tell it what image I want to look at. I'm going to say I want to look at the first build. 
So let's look at this. This output should look very familiar. This is just the lifecycle running, but it's running in Kubernetes this time. Um, we can see the same things we saw before. This is the output of detection. We don't have the prefixes, but it's all here. Um, same build packs are doing a build, and we're getting down to the export stage, which is putting our image in the registry. So let's just double check our work again. Let's pull this guy. And I'm going to run it. So this is the old version of the app. I'm going to recreate for you the exact same updates I did in PAX so you can see how they work in this new declarative platform. So next thing I'm going to do is, first of all, let's show you that this image has the same old JDK version. I'm going to copy paste this because there's no way I'm going to type that. OK. All right, so here's our build materials for the new image we generated. This should all look familiar. Oh, we have the old Jerry. Let's fix that. So what I'm going to do to fix it this time is I'm going to edit my builder definition to point at an updated builder, which should have the new build packs in it. And I'm going to apply it. So now if I come and look at this cluster builder, I should see when I scroll up and look at the list of build packs here that I have the new version of the OpenJDK JRE. Now, what KPAC is going to do is it's going to look at images that this build pack contributed to and see that there has been a build pack update and it needs to schedule a new build. So I'm going to look at the builds again. Um, we can see a new build is scheduled. I'm going to show you something that's helpful uh, as a developer when you see builds running in KPAC. Because let's say an operator has updated the builder or a run image, you might not know why a new build has become scheduled. So what I can do is look at the annotations on the image. If I can spell annotations. Uh, let's just do the whole thing so I don't have to type this live. OK. All right. So you can see that the reason for this build was a config change. This is because I did all the builds. That's the problem here. Hold on one second. So let's get the particular build that we want to look at. There we go. So the second build was scheduled for reason build pack. I updated the OpenJDK build pack. And it's kicked off a new build, and it's telling me why it did that. So again, I can use the logs tool. Look at the second build. We can see it's almost reached the end of the build. If we scroll up, we can see it installed the newer JDK. Um, and we can use pack inspect image again to look at our newest metadata and see that the JRE is updated. So what's nice about using multiple platforms that each use cloud native build packs is because they're using the same underlying lifecycle and implementing the same specification, I can build something with a tool like KPAC, but still use a tool like PAC to get information about it. So all of these modules are plug and play. I can plug in a different platform to run the lifecycle. I can have the lifecycle plug in a different build pack as long as I'm implementing the specification. So finally, we're going to do a rebase. So let's look at this image again. 
but this time not at the bill of materials. We're going to look and see that again we have the uh, older version of the run image. So I'm going to make sure that I have this label the same in my Docker local. This is just an alias for localhost, by the way. Um, Okay, so I got a newer version here with a newer SHA. And I'm going to Docker push this. And this time, I don't even have to apply any changes to KPAC. The builder contains a reference to the run image. Eventually, the controller that we have running is going to notice that change to the run image and reconcile all the builds. So let's look and see if it's happened yet. Give it one second. It's going to pull the registry, see that the run image is updated, which should update the builder, which should get us a build scheduled at some point. Any second now. We can look at the builder first so we can entertain ourselves while we're waiting. So we can see the builder's already been updated with the newest run image digest. Ah, so our rebase happened. And this is a rebase operation like the one we showed in pack, so it happens very quickly. Um, and if we inspect the image again, we're going to see that it now has the newest base image. So the final type of update we have is a source update. Actually, first, let me show you the reason here. Uh, so let's say when we have a build that is a rebase, We can look at the annotations and see that it was updated for reason stack. The stack is the word we use to refer to our base images. So finally, if we want to update the source code, we can change the branch we're pointing at here. This will also work if I push an update to master. So soon we should see another build getting scheduled. So let's look at the reason for this build. We can see this one is reason commit was the source code change. So let's use our logs again. I believe this is build number four. And it's going to be cloning from our new path. And it's going to do a rebuild. And it's going to update the source code. It's adding just the application layer, like we saw in Pack. So this maybe is repetitive, but I want to show you that all of these platforms, so they provide a really different interface. They all are doing the same thing at the end of the day, using the Cloud Native Build Pack lifecycle. The other thing to think about when we were showing some of the automatic updates, like around the rebase or around the build pack change, is that this story becomes very strong when you're managing hundreds of applications, right? All with KPAC. So when I push a run image change in this particular demo, I'm just seeing one image get rebased. But if I had 500 images, 500 images would get rebased when I did that one Docker push. The same thing with the build pack update. So let's pull this down. And run it. And we've recreated all the same updates in KPAC that we did in PAC. 
In some ways, I had to go out of my way in these examples to create situations where there's an out-of-date JRE that needs to be patched. We have an out-of-date run image. If you're pointing at a builder that's managed and it's getting regularly updated build packs and regularly updated run images, you don't necessarily even need to think about these things happening. They'll just be happening behind the scenes by default. So we barely scratched the surface here. Pack has a lot of tools you can use to manage your own builders or customize your build with your own build packs, extend your build. But I think this gives you a general overview of how you can use Pack to iterate, use Pack and KPack to iterate on your source code and also have a strong security story and make sure all your dependencies are up to date. Cool, thank you, Emily. I'm not sure if y'all are ready for Pack, but your kids are gonna love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's come back to that, uh, that example of uh, uh, Mector and Speltdown. Specter and Meltdown. Um, so again, we had to update every one of our Java applications, right? And with something like Dockerfile, you have to rebuild. But with Rebase, it's like a bolt of lightning. All of these apps can be updated almost in instantaneously, uh, bringing them up uh, to compliance. And this is actually what happened on uh, a platform like Heroku. Uh, when the uh, Specter and Meltdown patches were released, uh, we updated 10 million applications essentially overnight because of this ABI compatibility. So when Emily uh, ran pack inspect image, she got this bill of materials that told her what was in the image, right? Uh, it, it gives us a, a way to audit what we're putting into our production runtimes. And this is something you can't do with Dockerfile, right? Like each little snowflake Dockerfile, there's no way to control what uh, a particular developer has added to that and is putting into, into your runtimes. Build packs in general give you a unified way to control your build processes and audit them and, and uh, run containers like an adult. Is that the? <laughs> yeah, it's, you're getting inside of the head of your image, right? I'm from the future. Mm -hmm. OK, so pack and kpack, which uh, Emily demonstrated, are two platforms. As we mentioned before, there's uh, other platforms you can use to run build packs. Uh, Azure's ACR pack build, commercial platforms like uh, Heroku, Tekton, the uh, Tekton catalog has a build packs template where you can uh, use this to run uh, the build pack lifecycle in a Tekton, Tekton environment. Uh, Riff is an interesting example because it's using pack as a dependency to create a sort of higher level abstraction platform, which is for functions and, and functions as a service. All of these work with the uh, specification that we've defined uh, and essentially, as Emily showed, work the same way and use the same build packs. So this is the future, right? Uh, we have now a higher level abstraction uh, that developers can use to turn their apps into images that are ready for production. Uh, we're separated developers from the concerns of the platform, which are the operating system updates and the system packages, so that they can focus on adding value to their business, building a Spring Boot application and writing features, uh, those things that a job developer are good at. If you want to use Pack yourself uh, and you're on a Mac, you can use Brew to install it. Uh, we also have installers for Windows and Linux. Uh, but in any case, uh, oh, and you can get those from buildpacks.io. Uh, but in any case, once you have Pack installed, you run Pack Build on your application repository, whether it's a Java app or a Node app. Uh, you'll choose your builder, either Heroku or Cloud Foundry, uh, and it will turn that repository into a Docker image without you having to add configuration or adjust it. Um, it should just work. If you want to learn more, uh, go to buildpacks.io. We have uh, documentation, uh, some other important links, videos to talks like this. Uh, you can join the conversation at slack.buildpacks.io. Uh, we have a growing community with lots of people answering questions and discussing uh, the future of this specification. Uh, you can find the source code on GitHub at github.com slash buildpack. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining us. Does anyone have questions for us? Yes. Sorry? So, you're, uh, so the question is, how would I test a build pack? So are you, uh, as the author of a build pack, is that your question? 
Right, okay, so for, first of all, so most people that are using build packs will not write their own build packs. They will typically use a build pack that's, uh, you know, provided by either Cloud Foundry or Heroku and, and very mature or whatever. But yeah, you can write your own build packs. Um, the, the build packs themselves can be written in higher level languages like Go, or, or some of them are just written in Bash. Uh, and you can unit test it with whatever, uh, you know, unit testing framework goes with that particular language. Um, if you're thinking about more like integration testing, um, there's some examples in both the Heroku and Cloud Foundry build packs where uh, those, those entry points of detect and build, uh, we actually execute them, have them, as part of an integration test, have them download the JDK or whatever, and then assert that the, what we expect to be there is there. So now on the other end of that, uh, if you want to test a new version of a build pack on your app, I mean, it, uh, it, if that's part of your question is just running that build and validating that the uh, build materials is what you expect, uh, or that the image is, that it runs in your test environment. Pack also provides some tools to help with that experience. So there's a build pack flag that I didn't get a chance to show that will take a build pack that's on your local file system and add it to the builder before running the build. There's also tools for creating your own builder. So you can take an existing builder and add your modular build pack to it or create your own builder from a set of custom build packs. And Pack will help you with that experience so then you have a builder image you can test. That's a question. The question was, is .NET or .NET Core going to be supported in build packs? I know that support is coming in the Cloud Foundry build packs. Maybe Joe can speak to the Heroku ones. No. <laughs> in the very back. I believe right now it's polling your source repository in order to trigger a build. I'm sorry, I wish we had a microphone for the questions. Do you know if there's an extra one somewhere? Mm -hmm. so, so no. So if we're talking about multiple builders and say I've updated a builder and KPAC is polling the registry to learn about the builder, um, I think you can configure the polling interval on that. And we also expect that in most organizations, there might be many application images, but only a couple builders. Um, that's sort of the general use case we imagine. But we also you know, provide a way for you to provide your secrets to authenticate with your registry. Um, but yes, it's configurable. <laughs> yes. Can you use build packs together with something like a distro lesson? Yes, so you can. We've been experimenting with that at Cloud Foundry, um, where we've created a distro list stack and have used it to build uh, Golang images mostly right now. Um, so yes, it works exactly the same. Like your run image is basically distro list image and the application layers get added. Very similar story. The build pack itself has to support that though. So not all build packs will. Yeah, build packs indicate what stacks they support. So not all build packs will support the distro list stack. So there's no official concourse integration that we can distribute. There are several implementations that I've seen of it. If you'd like to write the official one, be my guest and let us know about it. <laughs> so the Java build packs that we have, oh, you mean no, like so plugin? I think you mean like like Jib. So the question is if there's plans for a Maven or Gradle plugin. So so no, uh, Pack works like sort of in, like it uses an inverted model from the build plugins. So it's running outside of the build tool. So if you think of like a, a Maven or a Gradle plugin, what's controlling the version of Maven? How do you run Maven in the container? So Pack sits outside of it so that it can control those things as well. Um, 
But the advantage of that is one that you can, you can have a unified pipeline. So whether it's a Node or Python or Gradle or Maven build pack or uh, application, you're going to have the same build process, the same bill of materials that you can use, right? Um, yeah, the other, so that, that's the main advantage. The, also, the other advantage is that you don't have to do anything to your code. So like, you don't even have to add a plugin to your Palm XML. You just run pack build on the app. The build pack is aware of Maven and, and what a Maven project looks like and does the, you know, the same thing. Like it knows what the target directory is and where your jar files are and how to put them into the image. But it does that by sitting outside of the build tools. OK. One more. How is configuration delivered to build packs for Yeah, the, uh, how, the question is how is configuration delivered to the build pack? Uh, in, in most cases, it depends on the build pack. Uh, the Heroku build pack uh, looks for a, a system properties file, which defines the Java runtime version. Uh, some build packs work with environment variables, which you can pass to it via um, like the dash E flag on pack. Um, as part of the specification, I think we're working towards uh, or considering some kind of like uh, universal or unified way to do that. Um, but right now it's just on a build pack per build pack case. Is it smart for like a spring that actually will like, pull out the dependencies and put that into a separate layer? The, I, it depends on the build pack. Um, the, I don't think the Heroku build pack does that now. Um, I'm not sure about the Cloud Foundry build pack. It's too bad Ben Hale had to leave early. He can answer the specific mm. questions about the Java build packs. Um, but yeah, again, uh, some build packs will do that. Some will do it at a very fine grain process, like a fine grain level, like uh, uh, layers for very specific parts of your dependencies. Um, so it just depends. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day.